China has been Africa's largest trading partner since the year 2009 when they surpassed the United States of America. This week we're discussing China-Africa uh, trading relationship and particularly focusing on the summit that saw uh, the president of China, Xi, Xi Jinping, promise a turn up to one million jobs. Apologies for the pronunciation of the name, but it's quite complicated. Otherwise, I'm joined by a very interesting panel of ladies and gentlemen who will help us unpack the conversation and put perspective to the topic. So in no particular order, I'll begin from my extreme end to my immediate right. Uh, just quick introduction and uh, shall delve straight into the conversation. Most welcome. All right, uh, thank you so much, Drake, for always having me as usual. Uh, my name is Denise Ayabare. I am a student at Makere University. But above all, I am just an African holding a Ugandan passport. Definitely. Every, every time I have Denise on the show, there is always a different way that I introduce and the titles that you have. It's, it's, it's amusing mm -hmm. and quite interesting. Gentlemen, you must welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Drake, for having me on the show today. Um, been seeing this show on YouTube yeah. and colleagues around, but um, it's a pleasure. I'm here for my first time, and um, I'm very grateful to be here to discuss a very important topic. And um, my name is Joseph Nsamba. I'm a student at Makere University. I'm doing a bachelor's degree in medicine and surgery. It's very surprising that a medical student is on a kind of show, but uh, like she said, I'm also a very concerned African who really takes interest in um, global matters. All right, so very happy to have you here, you. Joseph. Uh, it's quite true that oftentimes the, the perception has been that medical uh, personnel are not so much interested in political issues, but there's been a change in that trajectory. Yeah, yeah, so uh, most welcome. Thank you so much. My name is Oprah Nkalubo. I'm a law student at Makere University and also the Vice President of the Children's Reference Group and the UNICEF and Ministry of Gender. And I just can't wait for us to unpack today's topic. All right, interesting. So let's just start the conversation. I'll begin with <coughs> Oprah. Oprah, we're very happy to have you here. And uh, you. understanding this conversation obviously requires, after, requires us to put a face to it, but also context as well. And as I earlier on said, that China has been Africa's largest trading partner ever since 2009, when they surpassed the um, United States of America. And that being said, figures show that China has approximately invested up to a ton to 282 billion US dollars in, the con in our continent, Africa, here. So help us put perspective to this conversation as we delve deeper into the topic. All right, thank you so much. Um, so what we had on Thursday is the China-Africa summit. And what we got from this summit <coughs> were um, different pledges and promises from the president of China together with um, other leaders. There were about 50 leaders from the different African nations, and um, even together with the uh, General Secretary of the UN. And they were together in this sort of summit, and they were discussing pertinent issues on how China and Africa can be able to develop together. But then um, while we look at the different pledges that were made, and uh, even the different contracts that were signed, we have to look further and look deeper and sort of um, look deeper into these sort of pledges that are being made. Are they really for the benefit of us as Africans or as Ugandans if we try to um, centralize it? Because when you look at, 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 at these promises, um, the president of China says he's going to disperse about 50.7 billion um, uh, billion US dollars into the African economy and he promises about 1 million jobs um, for Africa. But now when you bring that into a perspective of Uganda, you realize that 1 million jobs, that 1 million jobs that are being scrambled for the entire African continent cannot in any way solve the unemployment issues that we have here today. Because you ask yourself as Uganda, what percentage are we going to have? in terms of, of, of those jobs. And we also have to put into context that this 50 uh, billion or so that, is, uh, that wants to be dispersed into Africa will not come in ready cash. It's going to go into things like infrastructure. And we know that this infrastructure, the Chinese will come with their skilled labor. So where our Africans are going to be placed are going to be manual work, 
um, work whereby they're not going to be highly paid. It is just cheap labor, if I'm to put it that way. Then there were also different conversations around uh, China investing in investing in the resources that we have as a continent and using them to power nuclear plants, using them to power electric cars and make um, these different um, green innovations for us as Uganda, as Uganda and even as the continent at large. But we have to sort of look deeper because on the surface it looks good. But then for us as Ugandans, when we sort of centralize this, or even Africa at, at large, you find that um, these policies, though they seem good on the outside, at the end of the day, they're going to be to the detriment of us as Africa. Because leaving alone just the promise of a million jobs, and it's just a promise, it is not guaranteed. And even if it is guaranteed, we are talking about one million <coughs> jobs for over a continent with so many people. Here, Uganda alone, we have over 50 million people. And then we have a huge number of people who are unemployed. Our young people are unemployed. And they're also in millions. So how are we then going to um, sort of apportion these jobs that are being promised to us? So it's something that's not workable. But then at the same time, this money is going to come in, but in terms of debt, yes? And we already have a huge debt burden. And you realize that the Chinese are not even giving us debt relief. It means that this money, we're going to have to pay it over time. <clears throat> and we've not even been able to pay the debt that we have currently. So you see that when we have all these factors coming into play, factors whereby we're going to have expatriates come in to work, and our local people are just going to, if they do get those jobs, they're going to be, be, they're going to be cheap labor and in very little money. Yeah, And then when that is just at the side of it, we have a huge debt burden that is also going to come through. But then we also have another challenge whereby our resources are going to be utilized by the Chinese to make these machines and leave our environment and leave our societies, um, leave our societies with climatic problems and, and yet those vehicles are going to be taken to, those vehicles are going to be manufactured from wherever and then brought back. And we have not only suffered climatic issues, but we're also going to have to pay our own money, our hard earned money, to actually purchase these goods that have been, um, that have been manufactured <coughs> with our very own raw materials. And then we ask ourselves as Ugandans, maybe who are producing goods, because we have Ugandans who are manufacturing items, where are those Ugandans left? So this summit really leaves us with so many questions. And it is something that looks good on the outside. But when you really internalize it, um, I think we really have to have a second guess as Africa and as Uganda. OK. Um, Denise, <coughs> um, Oprah just pick up from where she, say, she, she, she ends her, her discussion. She says we need to have a second guess whether it's appropriate or not. And looking at the relationship that China, that China has built with the African continent in terms of the, in terms of trade, in terms of cooperation, and in terms of development, they seem to be an equal partner. And over the years, the Chinese have tried to prove that we are here not to burden you as a as a country. We respect your sovereignty. Mm. We, we we respect your equal partners and we work together. Unlike other partners, China is trying to portray itself as we are equal in this. So what do you say? from what Oprah just uh, discussed in regard to what I've even mentioned. Um, Drake, one thing is very certain that uh, over the time when we saw the Africa-China summit happen, everyone seems to say everyone has a plan for Africa, but Africa doesn't have a plan for itself. And it's something that is very problematic. When you look at the different actors, uh, they say it's better the devil you know than, uh, I don't know what it says to complete it, yeah. than the savior, <laughs> I don't know, than the devil you don't know. Than the angel. Exactly, than the angel you don't know. Mm. So usually, when we look at even how Western powers have been within the African continent, they have continuously deprived Africans of their sovereignty. They have continuously pursued things like neocolonialism. Our policies are a basis of imperialism. Mm. We likely do not have anything that belongs to us. And China comes in a place where mm. it sort of offers that. And I'm just going to put context to what I'm saying. You, you saw how the war in Ukraine, let's say even the war in um, the Gaza-Israel war, it sort of displayed that 
selectivity that occurs within the Western, the international powers. And it showed that if an international, uh, if you have international backup, likely what that changes, yeah? The top 10 crises over the years, over yeah. the past six years, have been in Africa. Talk of Democratic Republic of Congo. Talk of Chad. I usually just hear Chad in headlines. I don't know who their president is, but the only thing you hear about it is war. You talk of northern Nigeria. These are countries we don't usually talk about. The Horn of Africa that is so proximate to us. You have seen Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia. These are countries that have continuously battled with war, the parts of Cameroon. Yeah. But no one ever says anything about them. They're just headlines. They're just notes in textbooks that we use for our reference. And China comes in in a position where it's offering military aid. Like Oprah has said, see, the 50 billion USD is practically supposed to be military aid. Are we together? I don't think the most proximate problem to Africans right now, even when we are great one conflict, which has continuously been fueled up by actors from outside Africa, should be the most important thing that China comes in to partner with us. Mm. I think on food and other issues, they are pledging 280 million USD and some other pledges. But that pledge is directly to things to peace and conflict, which is very close to us. But you see, when you give a government that cannot control its own, um, when you make it militarized, when you give it access to military aid, then that means on the counterfactual, you're likely giving also things like al-shabaab you're giving also other people in northern uh, the boko haram you're giving also the other militants that have happened to be in the region back up from elsewhere so it becomes a competition of who can provide better military aid i think you've seen this uh, with even BRICS, the wagner group like what i'm saying is that BRICS is not the best actor china mm. is also not the best actor the west is not the best actor and this is where africa is just being divided and and made uh, Non-partisan, because if you're not with the U.S., you're probably with BRICS. If you're not with BRICS, you're probably with EU, the Western powers. And it comes at a point where we don't know what we want as Africans. Yeah. Whoever offers us what looks better. Zambia no longer has access to its airport, if I am well informed, because China owns it. They fail to pay a debt back to China. We say China is a better actor, but try it and not pay back their they are alone with the interest that they deserve. I think most of the property, they are not like US. We are giving you this, use it particularly for education. We are giving you, use this particularly for this. What they say is that we are going to get your assets. If you fail to pay back, we seize your airport. If you fail to pay back, we take over. And these are generations that occurred to pay for an airport, things that give you money and everything. So even when you're talking about this, I think both but actors are bad, Drake. Denise. I'm not defending anyone. I'm trying to put a picture to how true, bad true. they can um, both be. I, I understand your, your argument mm -hmm. that you have uh, a partner in China mm -hmm. who offers you, um, uh, let's say, money to carry out development in your country. They don't determine the terms of how you're supposed to have that infrastructure development. For example, our expressway. One of the best. <laughs> Most expensive, anyway. <laughs> uh, they, they offered Uganda um, money to construct the, the, the road. And what they've offered is for, for you to pay your loan, you have to, they are collaborating in partnership to you know, raise the resources in hand. But also, similarly, in countries like uh, th that you've mentioned, if because <coughs> The fact is, most African countries have failed to manage their states. The issue, the question of governance, still lags and still stands. And China, business, true, business, true. you you must pay what you owe. So if you don't pay what you owe, then how will the other country gain? So if they're offering you aid and you fail to pay, we run your, your airport for a, a few years and give it back to you. It's still a win-win, isn't it? Drake, I, I, think, I think the solutions that Africa needs, and that's where I began from. Everyone seems to have a plan for Africa, but not Africans, yeah? And our problems are more than just having maybe money. And that's why I put context to the money that is coming within Africa. It's specifically for military aid. Yeah. Most of it, uh, the 50 billion is supposed to help with military aid. And when you talk about governance, that's a discussion we can always have. But you see... With bad governance, there is no way you're still going to manage that money. You likely have overtaxing your citizens to be able to pay back all those debts that you owe them. Your airport is gone. You likely do not have assets as a country. You're likely operating the country like a company where you just sell citizens as shares. So the next morning, you can wake up and find you're not a citizen of Uganda. Right, China so owns you. <laughs> I mean, so, so Denise, is, would you rather prefer a partner who offers you a solution, you do it in your own terms when you fail to pay, 
since it's giving you money, we run over the business, pay ourselves back, and give it back to you and run it the way you have to. Or get the other partner, offers you money, and offering you money, they are giving you terms on how you should spend it, and at the end of the day, you don't have any, any impact. And what I believe in is African <coughs> solutions for African <coughs> problems. I don't think there is always a good actor between the West and the East. Yeah. I actually think that we shouldn't be able to choose between the West or choose between the East. We should be able to get solutions for the African problems. And that's where my entire uh, discussion is premised, on how we can leverage a way of making sure that if Africa, um, if China doesn't pioneer things like imperialism, neocolonialism, how do we benefit from that aid while we are remaining as African solving African problems? All right. Yeah. I'll get back to you on the question of peace and security. <laughs> but let me just get to my brother Joseph and yeah. let me talk about the aspect of infrastructure development. Mm -hmm. uh, just from what uh, Denise was <coughs> talking about in relation to the money that they're dispersing. They're dispersing approximately a ton of 320 billion Chinese yuan. And that is in, it's tailored to go towards um, infrastructure development. And that will be in terms of credit lines. And that's how they will disperse those resources. And entirely business. If a country is investing in, in your economy a particular amount of money to improve your infrastructure, that means you should be able to pay it back. So let's just look at, look at the relationship that the Chinese have built. Will this be able to, first of all, improve the infrastructure of various African countries and later on create those one million jobs that uh, the president of China promises Africans? Um, thank you, Drake. Um, first of all, uh, the China-Africa Summit uh, is popularly known as... Okay, it's popularly known as China-Africa Summit, but uh, the original name is um, Forum for... Africa-China cooperation. That's the name when we were beginning it in 2000. And um, from around 2006 to around 2021, they have injected about um, 191 billion in Africa. But um, most of that is in debt. And um, I'm just first build my context, but uh, I, I think I'll get back to your question. But let me first build my, my, my case. Uh, what we see in the Africa-China summit is um, um, something deeper, what Oprah was saying, what, something deeper which we don't see, it is a scramble for who has control over Africa. Yeah. That's the most hidden agenda. Like, it's, it's clearly a struggle between the, the big states. You see, who has the most control over Africa? Is it China? Is it America? We have seen similar summits. We've seen Africans going to meet Trump really important sometime. Uh, Biden of recent also had a similar one. Uh, the big states, India, Japan, have similar events. But the two big states, um, China and, and the U.S., are trying to fight as much to see who has the biggest influence on Africa, and specifically on African resources. Because we all know that um, resources in Africa have just begin, begun being mined in the recent century, 20th and 21st century, as compared to the West, where they found out way earlier, and they have been extracting their resources. So. The resources in Africa have been, um, are still fresh. So people are trying to scramble and fight for who has the biggest interest in, um, of Africa. But um, I want to, um, to quote, um, um, when, 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 um, when in the Russia summit last year, um, Ibrahim Traore, the president of Burkina Faso, said that, um, I actually wonder why Africa should be coming for these summits to beg. Because back in Africa, we, have, we are very rich with very good climate. I don't know why we should be coming here to beg. We should actually be coming here to discuss as leaders on the same level and probably maybe to help you give you food. Because he said a country like Burkina Faso with very good climate comes to beg for Russia for food. It wasn't making sense. And he was wondering what the previous leaders have been doing. But, but that's, the, that's the thing I asked Denise, the question of governance. If at all we are offering you credit mm -hmm. to carry out infrastructure development, and you have other partners who are offering you that same credit, but with very st uh, 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 strings attached that actually do not make so much sense, then which one would you opt for? So like, infrastructure development is something that we need, right? Yes, I, I agree. Uh, the issue of Africa is, we don't need, the issue of Africa is big, like you said, the issue of Africa is governance. We have what, it, what we need to make ends meet. I don't think uh, if you've seen Vietnam of recent is having very big uh, economic changes. I don't think they're doing that because of, um, because of um, foreign aid. 
once you fix governance issues, you have a good way to go. And um, if you look at the, the, the business model China proposes, China uses something called non-interference. They will give you a loan, will not interfere with your democracy, uh, will not interfere whether you, you respect human rights, whether you, you, you follow democracy, for them they don't care. All they f focus about is business. And um, however, our leaders um, are claiming that China is bringing infrastructure projects, but actually they're, not, they're not, not actually happy they're bringing infrastructure. They're actually happy that that money is going to come and some are going to, to steal it. Someone is, is aware if we bring a, a Kampala and Express Highway, we shall buy it for $100 million and we shall use 20 and still 80. That's why they are happy. And they are sure China will not question it. Unlike in the US where people actually will even question their investors who engage in corruption in foreign areas. I remember Trump sometime, his former campaign manager, um, Paul ben Menofort, and I think he was, he was arrested after engaging in corruption in Ukraine. Something which can never happen in Africa because China doesn't interfere with your, with your sovereignty. And that's a partner anyway. So let me, let, let me just hold you there and, yeah. and, and, and bring in Oprah. Oprah, um, still on the question of infrastructure and the partnership that we have in terms of bilateral relations, the Chinese and, Afri and the African continent has seemingly grown stronger and, um, and yeah, the relationship seems to be what would have term as cordial. There is mutual respect for each other and it's entirely business related. Remember a few years ago when, uh, uh, when, when, when the Queen passed away and African leaders <laughs> were, <In the> bus. <laughs> were stopped in a bus mm. and you had the Western leaders uh, cruising in very posh, nice cars. People argued that uh, the, the Chinese would not do this, the Russians would not do this. And that's an argument that still even persists among others. It still relates to the aspect of the cordial relationship, the respect that you have for each other, the idea that you look at someone as a partner, which ties me down to the argument of it, which bring it down to infrastructure development. He raises a very crucial issue that once China is releasing its credits, they have non-interference policy. Receive the money, do whatever you have to do with it, but ensure you pay it back. Now, the question is, as a continent, we are plagued with numerous unemployment <coughs> questions. We are plagued with a couple of infrastructure challenges. Shall this summit that has just concluded uh, uh, achieve its objectives? All right, thank you so much for the question. Um, so as I said earlier, when we look at this China-Africa summit on the surface, it seems as though it solves our problems. I mean, we are talking um, infrastructure benefits, we're talking about so much that helps us as Uganda or as even Africa on our end to solve our challenges. But this, we need to look at this in a deeper manner. Um, if we just look at this from the surface, what we, what we see is China giving us a couple of billions, um, us as the African, as the different African governments, being able to use this money to carry out infrastructure and maybe build a few roads, fix a few hospitals here and there, and then probably see um, our population having better social services. That is what we would envision when we see the China, the money coming in from China. But when we take a closer look, we have two different kinds of problems. We have problems on our end, but we also have challenges from the Chinese end. Now on our end, what we shall see is that when this money, when this money does come in, we have seen very many scenarios, for example, in our Ugandan context, where money comes in um, from foreign aid, but this money never achieves its purpose. You realize that money is brought in for infrastructure, and this infrastructure is even never fully built. We this 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 is um, a situation um, that is going to that has been given a time frame of three years. Within three years, money would would have been allocated to the different African continents, and developments should be established by 2027. But now, in Uganda, where you have a road taking over five years without it even reaching half 
its construction date. You find that these are the challenges that we are going to even have or even more with this money that is coming. So there is no guarantee that when this money comes, it will be allocated to infrastructure development. We have seen instances where even hospitals, money is brought in terms of foreign aid, particularly to provide um, medical services, to provide medicine, but this medicine is never bought. There are even instances where medicine is bought, but it is never dispersed to the people who actually need it. So these are challenges that we have within us. Whether the aid comes or it does not come, these challenges will be with us. But now assuming, giving you a great scenario, that this money actually comes, and then we construct these um, roads, and we build these hospitals, what are we going to get from the Chinese end? We're going to get a situation where the Chinese will have easy access to, Afri to the African continent and easily bring in their manufactured goods. Using our raw materials, they'll easily take out our raw materials and easily bring in their manufactured goods. And all this will be at the expense of us as Africans. What I'm trying to say is that the Chinese government will take away our raw materials because we have built good roads. Even when they bring in their different investors or expatriates, when they get sick of uh, epidemic diseases of malaria, uh, tropical diseases, you know, they'll easily get treatment because they have invested in great health care, right? So at the end of the day, you have the Chinese coming in to take our raw materials and bringing in manufactured goods that we will have to spend, that we'll have to actually spend on using our own money at very expensive rates. So you see, these are challenges that we have on both sides. <coughs> so despite the fact that it looks like a good picture for all of us, we need to look deeper in what sustainable ways can we be able to solve the African challenges as Denise was talking about. This sort of gives us a short term, it sort of gives us a, a short term solution to the challenges that we are facing. But the problems that will come after we have received this aid will be even more. Because we have not even discussed the issue of debt repayment. We have not even discussed the issue that there will actually be no employment because we actually right now in our country, Uganda, we have different um, different um, construction sites that are uh, being manned by the Chinese. But don't we still have unemployment issues in our country. So you see that even when we think, oh, unemployment is going to be solved or healthcare is going to be solved, this is something that is not really workable and it is not even sustainable. So it is important for us to go back to the drawing board and leave Chinese money aside and find out how can we work together as Ugandans, as Africans, to solve our African issues. But our African issues need money. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And you find that when we actually sit down on a round table, we can actually get this <coughs> money within ourselves. Isn't, yes. um, isn't, is, is, isn't, isn't that uh, too ideal to achieve? Just imagine mm. that the monies that we collect in Uganda, in terms <laughs> of monies that URA collects, doesn't even contribute to half of our budget. So how shall we even finance or even improve our infrastructure if the monies we collect from internal sources do not contribute half to the budget? So that, that's a very good claim. But then imagine if the budgets that were spent every day in state house, in parliament, were cut and we would be using money for what is actually necessary. Imagine the different, um, the different districts that have been put up for political <coughs> ambitions and political ideals are reduced and we have what is necessary. But, okay. All this. Let us just imagine we don't speak of ifs and maybes. Mm. Let us do the reality. The reality is monies are going to be allocated in huge chunks of, 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 of shillings to state house huge chunks of shillings to parliament and will do nothing about it. So, does it then negate the fact that we do not still need the money? Because even when, we, even when you claim that they cut budgets from state house, they, uh, they, they, they cut the unnecessary expenditure and all, it will not happen. So we need this, we need this relationship, we need more money coming in because they, they, they still need more avenues to steal. Can I come in as a burning point? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you see, austerity is uh, bad politics, mm. but good economics. Mm. Austerity, that's when government cuts expenditure. Mm? 
Mm. Let, let me go. So austerity is bad politics, yeah. but good economics. Mm. You see, in Kenya, after the finance bill, they had to do austerity to cut government expenditure, and that of money was 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 reserved. So, the question still goes back to governance. There's a lot of money being wasted on politicking, and not the real the real gist of where we need to give back to the people. So you cannot say that we need money, yet we have a problem. Use austerity, reduce government expenditure. The, the fact that you are saying we should not do anything about it should worry you because we, we must think about solutions to fix African problems. True, and I 100% I, I agree with you. Yes, yes, yes. But the reality seems not to agree with us. The fact is, the example you've used is perfect. Kenya as an economy is a democracy way ahead of Uganda. We are nowhere close to Kenya. Okay. That's for a fact. When we tried to go out and uh, go on the streets to fight against corruption, you saw what happened. Now, if you compare Kenya and Uganda in terms of democracy, in terms of development, we're two different economies. So it comes down to all individual states and how the countries are run. The fact is, the Chinese will still offer money, they will, and the money they will offer, they will say non-interference, as you clearly stated. Do your business. And that is what our African countries want. So the issue is, how can we, the question of governance is something that I would need to both of you to answer. <laughs> but for now, let me, let, me just get to, let me just get to the knees. And we talk about, first of all, clean energy. Uh, the, uh, when you listen to the speech of the president, uh, Xi Jinping, he talked about having a tone of uh, approximately uh, uh, offering 30 clean energy points, nuclear energy, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And particularly, the relationship of Africa-China has benefited Sub-Saharan Africa a great deal. Cognizant of the fact that Sub-Saharan Africa is um, largely a poor part of the continent, and Uganda being part of the Sub-Saharan Africa. You know climate change has greatly affected Sub-Saharan Africa with approximately 52 million people by 2022 being affected by that. And that's like 4% of the continent. And realize that majority of the, the population in sub-Saharan Africa are women and young people. Mm -hmm. And those are the most vulnerable when it comes to climate change. Speaking from the perspective of climate, environment, and the relationship of China and Africa, how will this benefit the fight against corruption? All right. Um, thank you so much, Drake. Uh, a couple of things just to note. I think we still need China. I don't want to sound so Afro-pessimistic. Um, I am a believer of Pan-Africanism. But when you look at the AU budget, African Union is still funded by the European Union, almost half of it. So even when we still want to say that as individual countries, we should not pursue maybe and become neutral, it's sort of... Um, it's sort of bad economics, I would say, mm. because usually what happens is when you take a side, you need to take the lesser devil. Yeah, mm. the person who is likely going to benefit you, like China, is a better actor compared to the Western countries, and I think that's why the Africa-China relationship has uh, improved over the years. Now, speaking to clean energy, uh, before the summit actually ended. Uh, Tinubu, the president of uh, Nigeria, was able to sign uh, a nuclear energy project that is going to be funded. Um, in uh, South Africa, Ramaphosa was also able to sign a deal about, you know, they have been having a lot of power cuts. Domestic power is usually not there. So when you land in South Africa, you literally know you've landed in darkness because they have a lot of uh, cuts, of power cuts. Uh, likely, the the presidents of Tanzania and Zambia were also able to sign a deal. And this deal was likely about their oil projects now, even minus the clean energy. Salva Kiel, on the other hand, was able to sign a deal uh, about a railway line uh, going through Ethiopia and Djibouti. And you see, these are things that benefit Africa. It's not just about we're giving the money, put it in education. They are the needs. The most proximate problem to sub-Saharan Africa right now is climate change. And I could tell you... Uh, how it's affecting people and how urgent it is. Mm. And mostly it's the young people. And the young people make up the largest population of what Sub-Saharan Africa looks like. Drake, every time I tell you 600 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa do not have access to electricity, when you look at that population still, they do not have access to things like clean energy cooking methods. These are individuals, like I usually say, that need to walk distances to access even what to eat. Um, they have to access firewood. If they don't walk, they are likely going to die. Well, in the West, um, you just walk to be fit. And these are discussions we usually have. 
when you look at the amount of money that is going to be spent on climate change by 2030, it will likely be more than the budget of those countries. The GDP of those countries will largely go into combating things like climate change. So China comes in at a very critical moment where everyone is talking about climate change and everyone does not offer solutions. Yeah. China is offering solutions on that note. And notice, uh, just like um, it has been said, most of these countries have just started discovering their minerals. You know what the West tells you? Keep your minerals in the ground. Keep your coal, keep your oil in the ground. China tells you, we are going to support you. We are going to give you um, expertise. We are going to give you resources to mine your oil. And that's where the critical issue of what we have been talking about of climate justice comes in. When the West says, keep your oil, keep your coal in the ground, that means you as an African country don't use oil. U.S. has continuously depended on Rockefeller, which has mined oil for over 100 years. Denmark, the Nordic countries, have continuously mined things like coal. When you look at Germany, it still depends on coal mines. They open up new coal mines almost every year. But they tell South Africa, keep your coal in the ground. And that's why it expresses things like power cuts. China comes and tells you, we're going to support ECOP. The European Union will tell you we're not going to support ECO because the human rights, the environmental rights that come with it are going to be affected. But I want to say one thing. As countries, African countries, that do not have money, that largely depend on aid grants, 75% of the Ugandan budget is foreign funded. And this speaks to many other African countries. It's not just Uganda. Yeah. All the other Africa, Zimbabwe, you talk about Nigeria, you talk about our most proximate countries, Burundi. Their GDPs themselves cannot enable them to transition to clean energy without support. There is nowhere in Africa where we manufacture solar panels. All the solar panels that come within the continent are from foreign countries, whether they're US or China. They're from different actors. Congo that has 85% of the minerals that are needed for a transition from uh, the fossil fuels to clean energy it's one of the countries that suffers the most. Yeah. No one is providing a solution. So when you talk about things like solutions that come with renewable energy and climate change, I think China becomes a better actor. One, they provide you with the means to transition. And by means, I mean, if you're able to sustainably mine your oil, use it. You know how that trickles down. We can talk about governance another day and say corruption, people won't benefit. But uh, the bottom line is, what the policies look like, they benefit the people if well implemented. I know there is this discussion that, oh, Nigeria has depended on oil for all these years, Angola has depended on oil for all these years, but they have not developed. That is not about the resource being there. That's about the bad leadership and governance that exists within these countries. And that's why I usually say within African countries, we like to elect hyenas and expect them to take care of goats. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that we usually mostly do and... Uh, the politics of how they are more of ethnicity. For example, in Uganda, usually what happens at a time of election, it's a display of ethnicity that exists. Like, you do not have a political party saying we are non-partisan, we are tribeless. You're likely going to find if it's uh, UPC, like Drake you support, it's largely um, Acholi and Langis in that political party. When you say it's uh, NRM, you're likely going to find only maybe Banyankole or Western Uganda being part of it. So you see that our politics themselves divide us. But, and that's what trickles down to how we cannot ably use our resources, where you find one region being richer than the other. And that's not a discussion about climate solutions. I think it can come in later yeah. on how we use these resources and how they trickle down to the, to the effect of the people. But now the bottom line looks like China is there to support you, mine your oil, mine your coal sustainably, benefit your communities, and be able to ensure that you develop. On the other hand, renewable energy, it supports renewable energy, things like solar, mm. LPG. You're able to have all these things existing at a cheaper cost compared to the US. So when you look at who is the best actor in terms of climate change, China will always win uh, anywhere, anytime for me. So yeah. there's a possibility of actually creating more employment opportunities and see young people benefit. That is true, because uh, when you talk about climate change, it comes with opportunities. It's not just a challenge. You have a green economy. As people transition, you're making plastics. There are people who are making bots out of plastics. There are people who have made recreational centers out of plastics. And these are all jobs that we talk about. The circular economy, that means that if you use a bottle, it has to come back and be used. So you have a whole green economy. The jobs are likely to be there within 
the green economy. Now, what I don't understand is the infrastructure bit of it. Because every time you've had a construction that is being done by Chinese, you're going to see, you know those movies you watch with the Vietnamese hats? Those are the people you're going to see on the roads constructing. So, and that's, I think that's where the discussion is. Even when they enable you create these jobs within climate change infrastructure development. Uh, and even Xi Jinping mentioned it and said that most likely we bring our own experts um, our own expertise to come down to Africa to construct these roads. And that's why we are saying we're going to give you uh, like one million jobs. But those one million jobs, Uganda has 45 million. That 45 million in Nigeria is one state like this because Nigeria has around 250 million population. Talk about all the other countries on the continent. Uh, Kenya, the most proximate, has over 50-something million. Mm. And these are discussions that we don't usually want to have. One million, even the money they are pledging, is not enough for African problems to be solved. That money is very little. Like, it cannot take us anywhere, even when we say we need it as an actor, but we need to ensure that we have also our solutions and we can move forward. It's not a sustainable plan. In terms of sustainability, how we can sustain ourselves as a country, yeah. but then likely as a continent, we need to look at a way out. It shouldn't always be about the West and the East, like we are all saying. We need to find a way where we can be Africa for Africans. All right. Yeah. Interesting. Um, <coughs> let me just quickly bring in um, Joseph. Joseph, when you uh, just, Denise has uh, greatly discussed the, 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 the aspect relating to um, clean energy and climate change and what uh, the Africa-China summit looks like, but also in terms of the relationship that China uh, offers in terms of climate change mitigation and adaptation. But uh, something I'm interested in is the aspect of uh, mineral development, something that we have seen China still promising to offer a lot of support in terms of helping economies like the Democratic Republic of Congo, South Africa, among other African countries, mine their minerals and mine the minerals in a way that they can use it and effectively improve their economies. Will that being the relationship that has been established with China and Africa benefit the mineral development? Thank you very much for that question and I guess that's a very, very serious discussion we should have in terms of um, this whole Africa-China summit. I, from statistics, I have, I have seen 25% of the minerals being exported from Africa actually sold to China. 25 percent, a quarter. Uh, around the import, the imports we are taking to China are about um, we are getting from China about 16 percent of, of the imports. Then um, <coughs> about 16 percent, and um, of course you know there are materials. But um, the issue of minerals, 25 percent is a very very big percentage, and um, we need to first look at how the Chinese give their terms and conditions, and they're giving this money when the, when when they are. Because usually they, 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 they give you money and you think the collateral is probably a particular mineral deposit you have somewhere so that they can always mine later on. Mm -hmm. But when you look at um, the China deals, in most cases, they are very, very exploiting. Of, of late, I saw um, the government of Uganda, I think, has signed a coffee deal with the Chinese, I think, six days ago. But when you look at the... the, the, the the bill and how they signed the agreement, you see China trying to take advantage of Uganda, exploiting. Eh? So I really don't want to, I think it's a good idea, but um, because, uh, because um, you are an understate, sometimes it's yeah, like Uganda now, it's very hard to dictate um, how your, probably your contract is going to go because you are negotiating, but you are the underdog. So you really don't have good bargaining power. And secondly, maybe when they come to establish that probably the industry, let's say, that maybe doing value addition, let's say the the employment, people are being paid peanuts. The country has no minimum wage bill. People are working in factories, where people are making millions, and people are being given 7K per day, $1.5. So I think um, the idea would be good, but there are a lot of things we must fix. Yeah, if maybe you have to come and create an industry, how are the people benefiting? Because it's one thing creating an, an industry and paying citizens peanuts. Because yeah. then why are you there? And then, you see? So as a country, we need to sit down and, uh, oh, as Africa, not generally just Uganda, because what, what affects Uganda is affecting Djibouti, is affecting Libya. 
and whatsoever. So I believe that um, it could be a good one, but then the fact that Africa is uh, an underdog in terms of these negotiations and coming to consensus, they usually take advantage of us and then it turns out to be exploit exploiting. Mm -hmm. So the return on investment, if maybe we took control or took charge of the minerals ourselves, would be um, way bigger if we took charge and control. But Africa has a problem of lacking the expertise and the, and the, the, the expertise that is actually going to mind. Because now if you go, for example, in, 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 the, in West Africa, that's I think why the Franc most of the Francophone states have been still facing the, Fre the, 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 the French, the French, 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 yeah, the, the French, the French have refused to go. They, they're going, but they're not going. They claim Africa has no expertise. But then we must actively invest in creating the what? The, the, the expertise. expertise, because I believe we, we have evolved, at least people now are being exposed. We need, if we really have, if we are patriotic enough, if we have the goodwill for Africa, the governments must actively try to empower, because Drake, and um, if you look at Uganda, maybe five, um, 50 years ago, the lawyers we had were actually very few. Um, I think the school of law used to be in Dar es Salaam, and the lawyers were very few. School of law used to have like five graduates. I saw Kadaga's class had six graduates, I think. But because we have actively invested in it, we've gotten the people who are able to do that. And I believe there's nothing that we cannot do, even if it's about um, the, maybe the expert engineers or the, the, the technocrats probably in that. If the country has the goodwill, if Africa has the goodwill, they can actually get those. But because the goodwill is not there, and like she quoted, we vote um, highness, take care of, take care of gods. <laughs> so it's something that we really have to fix. But um, I believe the idea is good, China coming on. But because Africa is an underdog in the negotiations and making the deals, it really turns out to be exploiting. Okay. Yeah. Right. Let's just quickly go for a short break. Then we can now uh, shall come back and continue with the conversation and uh, have a deep understanding in terms of relationships in building uh, diplomatic ties. But among others, particularly what I'm my, what I'm going to focus on is the aspect of trade. Let's just go for a short break and we'll be right back. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten and a right for protection of minors among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Welcome back from that break. Just before we went into the break, we were discussing Africa-China Summit and uh, what does it mean, the promise of one million jobs. Uh, Opa, uh, just before we went into the break, I was quite interested in the conversation we had in the first half in relation to, first of all, the question of governance. And that's a challenge that plagues most African countries. And noticing that uh, corruption is among the governance questions that we need to answer, I think it's prudent that we have that conversation now. Having this relationship with Africa, China, is very important. As I earlier on stated, it's cordial, and there is mutual respect on both ends. But the only problem is, even when we get the monies, from, the, uh, from our partner in China, oftentimes the monies do not achieve its objectives. Now, how can we improve that governance question in some African countries that are plagued with questions of corruption, but primarily governance? All right, thank you so much for that question. 
um, throughout this discussion, you realize that the issue of workability is very prudent to our discussion today. Because yes, um, China looks like a good solution to most of the challenges that we have. We have talked about the green energy, we have talked infrastructure, we've even talked the terms that China has with, with Africa in general. And we see that it, it is a better sort of world that we would rather go with, unlike the options that are laid down on the table. But the question of workability is very important because even when we have these monies coming in, monies that we as African countries and as states are supposed to use to the betterment of our people and of our regions, the question of workability still stands. Because even when this money comes, we have seen issues of corruption arise. We have seen issues whereby we have, um, we have minerals being um, extracted from the ground. But then when it, comes, when it comes to how these minerals can be processed, our people have not been taught even such skills. We have our people, learn, um, our people lacking these basic skills of how to turn what has been got from the ground into useful items. And this even has now to be taught by foreigners or even done by foreigners, and we're not even being taught at all. So we lose out on the bigger picture. So the question of governance then comes in, that how can our government be able to mitigate these challenges that will come along the way? Because government has to work on implementation. Government has to work on educating the masses. Government has to work on um, providing market for our African goods. But when we have a government throughout Africa um, that, that is corrupt, how then do we create that balance? Now the question of corruption has been, it, it, it has sort of like become a song. Because what have we not done? For example, if you come into the Ugandan context, everything has been done. We have said corruption is bad. We have had walks on corruption. We have had marches on corruption. We have had tweets. We have had different forms of um, demonstrations towards corruption. Everybody in their capacity doing what they can do to be able to solve this evil. But now when we really sit down and ask how can corruption be eradicated with all the steps that we have taken, we see that it, it is a matter that needs to be taken in the most extreme measure. It is something that we cannot handle, we cannot handle lightly because it seems like even our, even our, even our methods that seem to be aggressive or extreme have not worked maybe because of how militarized the system we are working with is, or how the corrupt are shielded by even stronger powers. So this question of governance comes down to you and me. It comes down to the person at the grassroots who is affected. It goes back to which leader have you voted into power. But even then, you as an individual, or even the leaders that you're voting into power, have they cultivated within themselves, within um, their different spheres of influence, have they sort of shown a record of no corruption before you elect them or before um, you, you give them or entrust them with a position of power? Because we're going to have the same cycle repeating over and over from our LC1s to the highest office in the country. If we do not critically, if we don't critically scrutinize the people that we vote into power, you are voting a person into power who has been giving you soap in exchange for your vote. And yes, you need the soap. But now that in itself is an action to show you that for where they benefit, they would ably put money to other causes. But that is a person you're giving your vote. And that is a person at the end of the day who is going to decide. So you see that the cycle of corruption starts with us. It starts with who we are as individuals. If we are corrupt, we will find ourselves easily aligned to fellow corrupt people. And because of that, even the policies and even the, the sort of good implementation plans that we would have are then faulted or even are not really fulfilled because of the leadership that we have. So it goes back to you as an individual, me as an individual. What, what is our stance on corruption? Is it no? 
or are we maybe where it favors us we can we can take that route and where it doesn't then we can say no what is our stance and even when we are voting leaders 2026 is coming when we are voting leaders how have we scrutinized, have we scrutinized our leaders to know that this is the best individual to represent our interests, to represent what we need as community and be able to take us from one level to another. Because if we do not do that, we have seen that our marches have been futile. You have seen that every demonstration, every, we have had talks, we have had conferences, we have had different discussions on corruption but nothing has changed so it goes back to you and i on who do we put in power but most importantly we as individuals have we checked ourselves and have we made sure that we have zero tolerance for corruption all right um denise the african union came up with the agenda 2063 and uh, besides that agenda um, china as a partner to africa uh, promises to offer in terms of infrastructure development and improvement that would help us achieve the African continental free trade area where we can easily move our goods from one country to the next freely and effectively with very good infrastructure. And the, the potential of the African continental free trade area in terms of opportunities is quite enormous. Is that an age or does this summit uh, bring us closer to unlocking enormous potential to achieving the one million and many other jobs as well. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Drake. Talking about Agenda 2063, I think uh, Agenda 2063, when you look at peace and security, climate change, leadership and governance, it looks so well on paper. And for a fact, China, I think, has been supporting us as Africa for the past 10 years, like you said, since 2009 and before with their cooperation. I think even the project of the Express falls under their Belt Road uh, cooperation, their development. They have a couple of initiatives. When you look at the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, these are all things that align with the Agenda 2063. Yeah, Even when China's efforts are steady. I could say they are not enough to make us achieve the Agenda 2063. We appreciate them for their effort, we thank them for what they are doing, but that's not enough for Africa. Like you have heard, the money you have been talking about, 50 billion, imagine each of the African states is to take 1 billion. It doesn't even, it's not even enough because we have 54 states. When you talk about the 280 million USD that is supposed to go to food and then the other pledges, they are not enough for us to get to where we are going. If you wanted to ask the question of employment, what they are doing is to help a little bit to solve or tackle unemployment. But even when the effort's massive, they're not enough. I could say when you look at what China, and it has this precedence, all the Chinese projects, whether it's in Niger, whether it's in um, South Africa, whether it's in Malawi or Uganda, it has a precedence of bringing its own expertise. They don't use resource or uh, the resourceful people from African countries. Like I want you to tell me one time you've ever entered um, a Chinese construction and you found the supervisor being an African or you found the individuals that are not working in probably mining, that are not working on uh, the green red things when they are constructing the road, are not Chinese, but they are Ugandan or they are even Africans. Those are some of the issues that we would like China to tackle even when we are talking about the employment. They enable us to get somewhere, but the efforts are not, I don't know if you're getting what no, I'm yeah, saying, yeah, the yeah. efforts are not enough. Mm -hmm. I, I can't paint a picture of how not enough they are, even when you look at the statistics of the money or anything. But still talking about unemployment, I think it's an issue of leadership and governance. Most of the times we want to attribute and say all the time we need to be saved, we need to do all this. I, I believe that as Africans we have the ability to employ the entire African population within Africa. I don't see a reason as to why we would have our best out of the best even leaving the countries to go and look for better facilities to work or even looking for our skilled labor. Uh, Africa, uh, in terms of human resource, has the ability to provide anywhere in the country. Mm. If it comes to a thing of human resource, Africa has that. When you look at uh, the people, the expertise or the knowledge, Africans have that. When you look at the geniuses in NASA or anywhere else, Africans, if they're not Indians anyway, because of their population too. But 
in terms of human resource, we have the best to offer to the world. So if we say development should be in terms of human resource, we have that. If we say that anything like innovations, technovations, Africans would be the first to do that. Have you asked your problem why we don't have that? And that's why maybe the investment is there, but it's not enough. It's more than a conversation that would have another day about leadership and governance within African countries, or even the AU, because I think AU could have enabled all these things. When you look at the African um, continental free trade area, it's one of the very best that should happen, yeah? Because I don't see the reason as to why you should leave Uganda and go to Kenya, but you can't access anything like uh, internet. You can't use your SIM card. And these are trivial things that we don't usually have a conversation about that China shouldn't even be doing. Or the reason as to why I should be able to step in a different country and probably I can't access even online banking services because they're not there. And you know money is the mover of any development. It is very critical in development. But these are issues that at a continental level that we should be able to tackle. I don't know the reason as to why I should be flying an expensive flight from Hedrick, from Uganda to South Africa. I don't know why I should be soliciting for money to go to South Africa. Like, the flights that within those countries are very expensive. And this and, and issues not China should be solving. Because if China talks about infrastructure, I don't know if it's China that removes the visa restrictions for Ugandan to travel to Morocco or for Ugandan to even access Nigeria. Nigeria has most of the expensive visa. I don't even know why it's expensive. It's about 200 USD, even for an African. These are not issues that China solves. These are issues that at a continental level, we should be able to tackle, to talk about economic development, to talk about trade, even besides the infrastructure. You could have the infrastructure, but the free movement of goods and services, the ease of it, the money in the economy trickling down and without needing probably a forex trade to change money when I move just to Mea Burundi or anything. These are countries, Togo or Benin, that you don't need a visa to go to. Like, these are issues that we should discuss to achieve Agenda 2063. Even when we have the infrastructure, when you have the airports, when you have the fancy roads, when you have the fancy business ideas and all that being supported, even security initiatives, yeah. then what happens at a continental level? What efforts are we putting there to ensure we achieve at least the little efforts they have put there for us? We can't wait for China to do all that. Um, and I don't think the efforts are sufficient in tackling things like unemployment or even development. They're not sufficient. Powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Joseph, yes. we have reached towards, we have actually reached the end of our conversation. Yeah. Uh, just give us your concluding remarks and I'll do the same with Oprah and I'll conclude with Denise. Okay. Um, my concluding remarks would be that um, as, um, <coughs> as America, as China, Russia, Japan, India trying to fight for who has the biggest interest over Africa, because what China is doing is exactly what America is doing, it's exactly what Russia is going to do tomorrow, and any other countries, everyone is trying to fight for what's in the interest of Africa. And uh, I think we as Africa should see this as an opportunity to leverage on them. Personally, I want to take that as a takeaway. Um, <coughs> some people think that um, the China, America, they're, they're using us, but me, I want to take it as an, an advantage that we can leverage on to maybe take a step ahead because everyone is fighting for us. So if, if, you, are, if you have uh, <coughs> demand versus supply, if the demand is high then, and the supply is little, then you, you can take advantage of that. Um, um, Nelson Mandela used to, he was supported by the communists back then. And then at some point, the, the Dutch and the, the British were telling him that, oh, those guys are using you. But Mandela told them, if they're using me, but I'm also using them to achieve my own interests. So, doesn't matter whether you're using me, but as long as the relationship, I can also achieve my own interests. That's the most important thing. And that's the takeaway I would want because we have, um, we're in a situation where we're the bait. Everyone is trying to pull. So in that situation, as Africa, we must take um, advantage of that and put our interests at the forefront and leverage on that and make sure that our interests we front patriotism and make sure that our interests can be, can be fulfilled. But then, um, looking at um, the status quo of Africa, that might be far from being achieved. But that's what I would want to take away, because if Russia is bringing a deal, if America is bringing a deal, and they're trying to fight, 
you go with the best bidder who best fits your interests. Okay. But then, like we've been having the conversation, the issues all around governance, and um, people are more comfortable taking peanut deals um, and being exploited. Yeah, thank you. That's my take Thank you. Oprah. All right. All right, thank you so much, viewers, for joining us yet again. My takeaway goes to us and to our leadership, that it's important for us to scrutinize and look deeper into these issues that affect us as the African continent. I know that when they come on paper and when we hear different leaders who in these developed countries promising us heaven on earth, it seems as though all our issues have been solved. But it's important to look deeper and scrutinize and find out what are the best ways to use the aid that they're giving us, but then also be able to use that to develop our own people, to develop our own communities and create a sustainable future. Because that is the only way we will be able to get development that will help us, that will help people at the grassroots level and even the future generations to come. Thank you. Dennis. All right, um, thank you so much, Drake, and thank you for always having me. Well, um, <clears throat> a couple of things that are just going to be said. I think as Africans, we need to live uh, beyond the East and the West. We need to look for African solutions to the African problems. Yeah. Because we could say U.S. is a bad actor, but the same China is a bad actor. Because the U.S., I believe, is the biggest export of wars. I don't think they have another <laughs> export that they offer. But um, even bilaterally, as we are playing, we need to check out for what is in the best interest of Africans. But keep in mind, Africa is not going to develop based on our bilateral relationships. It's yeah. going to develop based on our leadership and governance. So any young person there, interest yourself in the leadership and governance, the politics of your country to ensure we have a future that we want. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Denise, Joseph, and uh, Oprah for the very wonderful and informative discussion that you've offered to us today. And to the technical crew, uh, uh, thank you very much for making this possible. Civic Space TV, uh, Center for Constitutional Governance. My name is Douglas Strekonen, I've been your host and moderator for tonight's conversation. See you next week, same time, same place. Bye-bye. Okay.